Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to join us for this webinar this evening, um, which is being hosted by AHDB Beef and Lamb. My name is Liz King. I'm the sheep scientist for Beef and Lamb within, NA within AHDB, and I'm delighted to be bringing you tonight's webinar on chronic wasting diseases of sheep. Um, this will raise awareness and reduce the risk of bringing in disease. Our presenter this evening is Nikki Robinson. Uh, who's been a farm animal vet for five years. Nikki is a sheep intern at the University of Nottingham and is looking at the insidious iceberg diseases of sheep and how they impact on flock performance, their diagnosis and control. The plan of action for this evening um, is that Nikki will take you through a presentation and then there'll be some time for questions and comments at the end. Piers David a colleague of Nikki's may help with some of the questions. Um, you'll all be muted throughout the webinar, but if anyone would like to ask a question at any time throughout the presentation, if you think of a question, then please just, just type it into the box on the right hand side of your screen when Nikki has finished presenting. I'll ask her those questions. Um, there shouldn't be any difficulties, um, but please do bear with us should we encounter any technical difficulties. Um, so without further delay, I'll hand you over to Nikki for this evening's webinar. Nikki, over to you. Thank you, Liz. Um, welcome to our webinar this evening on production limiting diseases in sheep. So these are also known as iceberg diseases. Throughout this presentation, we will look at these iceberg diseases and how they fit within the wider sheep industry and their importance and the relevance of, to both vets and their producers. Um, I know that in the audience this evening, we've got vets and farmers listening in and I'll try and engage with you all, but actually I've got relatively a short space of time to try and cover all five diseases. And so I'll try and cover the most important points. For more information, please look at our technical manual, which will be uh, published later in the year. And I'll also be doing uh, individual disease webinars, which will be available later through the NARDIS website. Anyway, I hope you've all got a mug of tea or perhaps a glass of something a little bit stronger ready and let's get started. Okay, so why an earth iceberg? Well, this analogy comes from the fact that only a relatively small proportion of the infected sheep within the flock will show clinical signs and the vast majority of sheep which are infected will be largely undetected. So why is this such a big problem? Well, it's a massive issue because infected sheep cause two problems. One, they have subclinical signs, those which we are not easily seen, which will affect uh, flock productivity and performance. And actually, secondly, they pose a further risk of infecting further sheep within the flock and thus continuing the infection cycle. If we turn to our five diseases, you can see we've got border disease, caseous lymphadenitis or CLA, Mighty Visner, ovine paratuberculosis or yonis and ovine pulmonary adematosis. So lots of acronyms in there but hopefully to make things a bit easier. And if we look at the diseases we can see actually that border disease sits slightly further apart than the other four in terms of clinical signs. So we'll look at border disease first and the main area of interest tends to be infertility. So we see abortions, we see barren use and we see small or weak lambs. And if we take that um, aspect and we look at where border disease fits within uh, poor fertility performance in use, we can see that it fits alongside nutrition, which we know is a large factor in new fertility, both in terms of short and long term nutrition. So getting those ewes ready in the correct body condition score pre tupping, maintaining that afterwards and ensuring that the correct nutrition is in front of those ewes at tupping time. We know as well that seasonality, of course, affects um, breeding, being short day breeders. We know, of course, that stress is a massive issue with poor fertility. And then, of course, we come to our infectious diseases. And we can see here that border disease, highlighted in green, fits alongside some of the other common infectious diseases. So Campylobacter, we've got Toxoplasma, Salmonella, and then, of course, we've got uh, infectious abortions, um, uh, enzootic abortions, sorry, so, which is caused by chlamydia. So what do we know, need to know about border disease? Well, it's a pestivirus. Um, it is able to infect both sheep and cattle. And that there is a prevalence of about a third of, third of flocks are affected um, within the UK, the UK flock. It's actually closely related to bovine viral diarrhea. And why is that? particularly important at the moment 
is because we get a relationship between BVD and border disease. So cattle and sheep can be affected and infected by both of these sheep, um, these diseases. And this is a real problem at the moment because of the BVD Free England scheme. It should be particularly considered that sheep may act as reservoirs for border disease or BVD and able to pass on either disease to cattle and lead to similar clinical outcomes in those naive cattle. This slide is a little bit tricky, but please bear with me. Um, there's quite a lot to take in, but it's very important that we get to the grips with this. When we look at transmission of border disease, it normally comes through the infection uh, the, of, um, uh, we get transmission of border disease into a naive flock through uh, the, the contact of a sheep with an infected sheep. And this could be initially from a persistently infected sheep or an acutely infected sheep. And, and we'll look at that in just a moment. So if we look at this infected sheep, which is in the bottom right hand corner, they then infect another sheep. If she's not pregnant, that sheep is able to, uh, to clear the virus and uh, she will mount an immune response, just as you or I would with a cold or other diseases like that. However, if our initially infected sheep at the bottom left hand corner here infects a pregnant sheep, then we've got a variety of different outcomes that can occur. We know that um, the immune system of a fetus um, develops about 60 to 80 days of pregnancy. And so if our infected, if our pregnant sheep becomes infected before the first 60 days of pregnancy, we can have a variety of different um, outcomes. Her fetus isn't able to mount an immune response. And so the virus, the border disease virus, will take over the fetus's body, have uncontrolled viral replication, and it can lead to a variety of different events. So as you can see here, we could have abortion, we could have early fetal death, and we can have barren use. In other cases, um, the virus can stay in the body of the, that unborn fetus and it can be born. Now, this at the fetus, because it's not got a full immune system, it doesn't get rid of the virus in the way that it would if it was a normal uh, immune uh, competent sheep. So we can see that this animal then becomes a persistently infected animal. And these animals can either have clinical signs, so a hairy shaker, a lamb which has got a crimped hair coat and it have, might have a fine tremor, or a persistently infected lamb can be born and look clinically healthy. If, however, uh, an infected ewe becomes, uh, uh, inf uh, sorry, a pregnant ewe becomes infected after 80 days of of pregnancy, of gestation, she is able um, and the lamb is able to mount a full immune response and remove or eliminate the virus from the body. Now the trouble comes in between these two periods, so between 60 and 85 days of pregnancy and actually we can get either clinical outcome occurring here. So, so it's just um, interesting to, to see how, how the disease works. I've actually just highlighted here, um, I wanted to stress that actually we do get in flocks without PI animals, we do still get disease transmission from these acute infections. And it's really, really important that we consider those in our control plans of infected flocks. So this, as we've stressed before, is um, a hairy shaker lamb. Uh, you can see a fine, uh, there was a the crimped hair coat and uh, before he ended up on our post-mortem table he had a fine tremor. So actually clinical signs of abortion disease we've talked to, um, of border disease sorry we've talked about before so we get increased barrier rates, abortions, we get weak or poor or small lambs and we get these hairy shaker or PI lambs. Now actually despite some cases uh, saying that you get storms Typically, farmers say that anecdotally they've said that actually they don't always get storms. They've had some issues around lambing time for a while, and it's not until we see these hairy shaker lambs that they really thought about border disease. We also can get uh, reduced uh, 
uh, lamb growth rates and sometimes you can see a tail in the in the growth rates of uh, lambs and infected flocks and so all of these signs that we might see are actually causes and reasons for us to get involved and to start thinking about border disease now the data here on this is actually from one of our, our case study flocks for the project and I just wanted to show you the effects of border disease with a normal so lowland flock. Now the farmer initially reported that they had strange lambs and that was the first issue in about 2012. That seemed to um, coincide with an increased barren rate. Um, the vet that initially investigated the case uh, was worried about trace elements but actually they all came back normal. Now this issue with the, the strange lambs continued until about 2014 and the farmer found that he started getting poor and um, woolly stiff lambs and they often die within the first 24 hours of life. Um, the affected uh, lambs were then sampled and they came back as infected with border disease. Now he has some fantastic fertility data here um, and we can see actually that the scanning figures are overall very good so that's the blue line read from the left side of the graph. And we can see that actually it really plummets around 2012. It does recover pretty well the next year, get a slight, uh, slight trough again, and then recovers well in sort of 2017 and onwards. Now that also is matched by an increase in barren rate. So that's the green line across here, and that's read from the right hand side. We can see that before 2012, the barren rate is sort of about two to two and a half percent, so nice and acceptable. And then actually they hike up and we get a massive increase in barren rate around 2012. And actually this doesn't really recover until re very recently. And these effects are very, very likely to have been caused by border disease and actually fit very well with the clinical picture that the farmer described to us. OK, so we'll head back on to um, the other um, to looking at all five diseases here and the rest of the presentation we will look at the remaining four. And as you can see, they actually link a lot better together with the clinical signs. And I'd like to really focus on the top uh, clinical sign, which is thin or wasting hues. So if we put um, that in terms of other causes of body condition score, poor body condition scoring use. Um, we've got, of course, inadequate nutrition. So that is the poor teeth or poor provision of nutrition. So we're not giving the girls um, those use the, the quality of nutrition that they require to sustain their body, their body weight and the body condition. We then also have endoparasites. And of course, by this we mean um, parasitic gastroenteritis or PGE or, or worms, you know, and we have liver fluke. And of course, these will affect a use condition by reducing the amount of energy that is available from the food that she eats. And then we've got our chronic wasting diseases. So we've got OPA, Medivisna, ovine yonis and CLA. Now, I wanted to look at a typical sheep calendar um, of course, we've got sort of tupping, we've got scanning, we've got lambing, and then we've got weaning. And actually, at each of these points in the sheep calendar, we are selecting out and culling those thin, unproductive ewes. And I think this is, sounds very similar, uh, familiar to a lot of us in the audience, actually. But actually, how many people stop and ask why? Why are these ewes not performing? Why have they not produced a lamb? Why have they not put on weight when others perhaps have? And we actually might be missing a really important factor, which might be limiting our flux performance. So I really urge those of you that either possibly have sheep or work with sheep and have farmers and producers to, um, to really investigate these thin and productive ewes. So within these, we get a lot of a loss of production. And of course, we get a large um, uh, a factor is that the infected flock, so all of these um, diseases, all four of them have a long incubation period. So that is 
from the time when they first uh, get infected to developing clinical signs and that can be really long and that's tricky in itself. We then get um, some animals which don't ever develop uh, clinical disease within their lifetime. However, they do have issues with subclinical disease. So that is reduced feed conversion efficiency, reduced fertility, poor colostrum and milk yield. And of course, this will then lead on to poor uh, lamb survival and lamb growth. So it's important that we really, really target this subclinical disease before we get to cases of clinical disease. So that is port up here suffering from Yoni's disease. Um, and it's really important that we get into this subclinical disease category before our, our flock becomes unproductive or unsustainable with a high proportion of animals with clinical disease. So I'll turn next to CLA. Um, CLA is caused by a bacteria which is uh, rolls off the tongue, Carinibacterium pseudotuberculosis, and we know that there is worldwide distribution of this. It was introduced into the UK about 20 to 30 years ago, and it's really spread quite widely since then. Now, one of the major issues that we have in the UK is that actually it seems to be slightly more prevalent or slight, quite prevalent within the, the breeding rams, um, so the terminal sire breeders. That said, actually, recently we haven't had any um, uh, prevalence data which has been accurate and thorough to, to compare these terminal sire breeders to other types of flocks. And actually, the data that we have on CLA and the, the impact on productivity is scarce. Within Australia, it's a massive issue and they have um, indicated that there's significant impacts um, on wool quality, which actually um, is supported by anecdotal evidence in the UK. And if we think about wool quality, it's probably likely that it's a symptom of, of physiological stress and so likely to affect other body systems, which may be more relevant to lamb production. So when a sheep gets infected with the CLA bacteria, the bacteria moves to the local lymph node, it sets up infection and this infection builds into large swellings of pus, which develop into an abscess. And within the UK, we typically see these around the face and the neck, as you can see in this U here. However, studies, and including those in the UK and Ireland, uh, have estimated that about 25 to 50 percent of infected sheep have internal abscesses too. And the most common area for these can be found in the lungs. So here we've got one lung, we've got the second, and the heart is just here. And we can see that this um, lymph node, which sits in between the two lungs, is heavily affected. And this, of course, is likely to be impacting on the ewes' performance uh, a lot. CLA is actually transmitted through close contact of infected sheep. Um, so that is spread by um, the open lesions. Um, so uh, with this you here, if that was to burst and spread to the next sheep, or it's spread through aerosol. So, um, uh, a sheep with lesions such as this right hand sheep uh, breathes out the infected um, the bacteria and they they sit on the, the nearest sheep's skin and they penetrate through cups and abrasions. Once infected a sheep should be considered um, as infected for life because we can get these micro abscesses popping up throughout the body which we can't always see on clinical exam. If we look at Mady Visner, the next on our list, um, it's really, really similar to CAE, um, which we see in goats, and OPA, which we see in sheep. Now, it appears that the number of flocks um, that are affected are increasing. And actually, 2.8% doesn't sound like a lot, but this is doubled since the last prevalence report, which happened in uh, 1995. And in 2012, it was estimated that 100,000 used within the national flock could be infected with, with MV. Once the flock is in, infected, the proportion of, of use so the within flock prevalence can range from about 5% to 80%. So there's a great big uh, difference there in the number of use that are infected. MV is spread via um, infected lung secretions, so infected um, breath almost, and drinking infected milk from from a dam. 
The virus can also be found in semen and saliva and urine, and it has been found in the male genital system. system. And um, so these infected rams also pose a real risk for the, the health of the flock, obviously serving a vast number of use, and even in flocks which use AI. The production effects of um, MV are very wide. Um, it targets multiple organs and so we get a real range of clinical signs. In the UK we typically see um, users of respiratory signs and these tend to be older girls, so over three years old, and it, this is often paired with weight loss and poor fertility. So in infected flocks we tend to see use being culled for these reasons. Um, data that uh, we've recently uh, found in our study appears to show that MV infection reduces milk yield by about 6% and actually this is likely to impact lamb survival and growth rate. Um, I really, really wanted to show you this picture. It's from um, two uh, rams, they're both three years old. On the left um, is a non-infected ram uh, and on the right the lungs are from a ram that has had MV. And we can see on the left hand lungs that um, they, when they're placed on the table, they sit nicely and flat and they fall away, revealing the heart in the middle. On the right hand side, these lungs are much larger, they're swollen, and with MV we get this marked enlargement, we get heavy lungs and we get a grey discoloration and we can get to see the rib impressions, which you can just actually see just here, um, where the lungs are swollen. And this has obviously caused a great deal of, of problems for this particular ram. I wanted to show you this case study data we have from one of our, our studies um, within the project. And it just shows uh, just the sheer amount of money that goes into replacing a whole flock. Um, I'd actually hate for people to become complacent with their MV infectious status due to a flock's performance because this flock had really really good lambing and rearing rates in the years running up to MV diagnosis. Um, the flock actually only found out that they had MV when a ram that they sold was included in a random MV screen on, on the next flock um, farm and until then they had absolutely no idea they had an issue with MV on the farm. When uh, this positive ram was found, uh, the this case study flock then screened a proportion of their, of their flock and over 60% of those sheep came back as infected with MV. Um, incidentally, once you're infected with MV, um, they, you remain a carrier for MV for life because you're unable to eliminate um, the, the virus from the body. So the farmer tried to carry on and lamb the flock as best as they had done, but they reported that actually the weights just started falling off the ewes and no matter how much feed they were putting in front of them, they couldn't maintain condition. So because of this um, and because the flock health deteriorated so quickly, they started selling ewes throughout the winter months and actually the whole flock was culled, um, as you can see here, between December 2016 and July 2017. Actually, in hindsight, the farmer realised that they had a very, very high turnover of ewes and this was sort of fueled because they had such lovely looking ewe lambs coming through that they kind of wanted to keep them into their flock. But actually this was, was pushing out ewes that would have left the flock perhaps a little bit later in a normal flock. And they were also able to top up condition with really good feeding. If we look at our fourth disease, so this is ovine yoni's disease. Um, it's caused by uh, exactly the same organism that causes a similar disease in cattle and so we have imaginatively the S type which is the sheep type and C type which is the cattle type and sheep and cattle can be affected. Um, however, um, we know very very little about the UK uh, sheep flock strain and this is one of the diseases actually where um, it tends, the clinical signs we see tend to vary greatly between different countries. We get, uh, with uh, clinical signs of yonis, we get weight loss and we get low or poor production, as you can see in, in this affected sheep here, but we do not get diarrhoea. That's where it really differs from cattle. We have no signs of diarrhoea in sheep. 
So this is a lovely uh, um, post-mortem picture and actually it shows you this gut um, from affected sheep. It's, as you can see, hyperpigmented or, or yellow. It's thickened compared to a normal sheep gut. But not all cases look like this. And so I, and I really, really would uh, recommend that if you're worried about Yoni's disease, you get the sample sent off to the labs for histology and we make sure that that's the way that you diagnose it. If we look at how Yoni's transmission occurs within the flock, Sheep are as exposed um, within uh, the first sort of six months of age, and it tends to be that um, the earlier they are infected um, with Yoni's disease, uh, they appear to have an increase, sorry, an increased susceptibility to disease the younger that they are. Once exposed to the disease, they can either clear the infection and not develop um, the disease, or they can become a latent carrier. And at this stage, it's undetectable that they've got yonis. These affected sheep can then develop and become uh, subclinical uh, carriers, and they then start to shed this um, MAP, so the bacteria, back into the environment. And this sort of completes that infection cycle. The subclinical um, sheep will shed bacteria and the clinically infected sheep will shed that bacteria. And as you can see, it completes the cycle and, and we start to get a real, real issue of infecting our younger, younger lambs caused by our subclinical and clinically affected use. This um, is a really neat bit we found from the project as well. Um, it's, I wanted to show you that the association that Yoni's disease has um, on you longevity. So the blue bar, I'm sorry, I've missed off the axis title. The blue bar um, represents flocks that are positive for yonis and the green bar represents flocks that are negative for yonis. And at this side, it should say the proportion of the flock that are over three years old. So these are six tooth um, ewes and upwards. And we can see that actually in those flocks that are affected or are positive for yonis, that only about 16% of their flocks um, here are, um, are older, all these three-year-old girls and upwards. And that's compared to um, the negative flocks, so those which have uh, no yonis in there, about 40% of their, their flocks are composed of these three-year-old ewes. So it's really important to see that actually yonis affects the ewe longevity. And actually a really important note to stress here is that none of these flocks, both the positive and the negative flocks, knew about their yoni status. They had no idea about that they had yonis until we tested for them recently. If we now come to our final disease, so this is OPA, it's uh, or yakshiti, or uh, it's also known as um, ovine pulmonary ado adenocarcinoma. And actually, this disease is very similar to MV in some ways, but actually, it's a real tricky one. Um, it seems to be the most difficult disease to pin down of all of our five diseases. Um, we have, due to the way that the virus works within the infected sheep, we have no robust way of um, diagnosing the, the infected animal in a, um, in a live animal. So that means that we can't um, provide pre prevalence or reports or have any idea of just how much there is out there. Um, case reports show that actually in flocks that are affected, they end up culling about 20% of their sheep. But actually, we think it's probably a little bit lower than that and more commonly about 4 to 10%. Clinical signs, again, very similar to MV. We get respiratory signs and we get weight loss. Um, some farmers um, within our case study flocks say that actually they find uh, they can just find ewes dead and they will they will look absolutely healthy and normal and suddenly be dead. And others say that they do decline and we do see this gradual weight loss. 
So OPA targets the, the cells in the lung and it develops into a tumour. And on the left here, I don't know if you can see, um, we've got very, very firm tumour. It's quite grey, typically around the heart area, but it has been found in other areas too throughout the lung. And we sometimes see OPA associated with an abscess or secondary infections, as we can see on the right here. So we can see the grey tumorous um, lesions and then we can see the abscess here on the right the bacterial infection and we can also get cases where MV and OPA occur in the same animal in the same lungs. Um, the gold standard for diagnosing OPA is through post-mortem and also then of course uh, sending the sample off for histology to confirm. We have had also preliminary reports of um, transthoracic ultrasound, so scanning used within an affected flock um, as a preclinical diagnosis. And, and the preliminary data for this looks really promising, but we just need a bit more um, research um, to understand the limitations of this test. So if we look at the most um, prevalent, uh, recent prevalence estimates we have for these diseases, bearing in mind some of the, the, the issues we have in, in diagnosing them, um, we can see that course border disease and uni seem to be the real tricky ones here. Um, this, this data here is collected from a, a variety of studies. Some of them are yet to be published, but actually it does does uh, mean that we need to get some of these diseases, especially yonis, it appears, well onto the sheep radar. So for the last few minutes or so, we want to, I want to look at diagnosis and control. There is an awful lot to get through here. Um, and so the rest of it, I'd like you to refer to the technical manual, which we've published, as I said, later this year. Please ask any questions you have at the end of the, of the presentation. So, it really depends on what the clinical situation is. So what are we trying to get out of the diagnosis or the test? Are we testing because we think we have the disease? Or are we screening a flock just to say, look and see if we have it? And that's a really big issue that we have when sort of diagnosing and our, and our approach to diagnosing these diseases. And then also, what do we do with a flock that then has a disease? What do we want to achieve? Are we going to eradicate it? Eradicate it? Do we want to vaccinate in some cases as possible? Or do we want to test and cull? So if we're looking at for an iceberg disease um, in a symptomatic group, so those in, in a flock that we suspect has any of these diseases, um, then we can look with the tests we see above. So you can see there's quite a heavy reliance on blood testing, but please, please be aware of the limitations of this. For example, with the Yoni's one, we actually have no Yoni's test that is certified for sheep. The sensitivity and the specificity or the sort of limitations of the test are, are tested against cattle strains of the disease. So it's really important that we acknowledge this before we go out and test those animals um, and we try and mitigate that. Um, again, as we highlighted earlier, OPA is a really, really tricky one to diagnose in the live animal. Um, and so it's a case of trying to, to understand what each test will, will tell us and the limitations of those. I do just want to put out there that post-mortems are really important um, and actually it can be really, really useful. Of course, fresh cases submitted um, for post-mortem to the local APHA or local labs or the vet practices can tell us a lot of information. So when it comes to screening a flock, it's a slightly different approach. Again, we've got the heavy reliance on, on blood screening, uh, blood sampling, but actually, again, we're trying to look for what, what we want to achieve from the screening. Um, so if we want to, um, to look uh, for, to make sure, do we actually have border disease, then um, that's really important to, to understand the importance of that test. We need to make sure that we have appropriate sample size. Um, and that depends on, as you can see here, the size of the, the flock. So how many, um, also 
how much prevalence we're happy with in the in that flock so actually does it matter if we have a low level of yonis in the flock for example and thirdly um, the confidence so how much does that owner want to be certain on the results we have so of course there's a cost basis and that uh, cost benefit um, sort of puzzle to, to uh, weigh up there when they're trying to work out just how certain we want to be in some cases um, actually so for example if we want to just look uh, for a disease it might be worth screening the most likely animals to have it so for example in CLA MV and yonis if we look at the ewes which are most likely to have encountered disease so that will be the older thinner ewes and that will give us a really good idea of, of whether or not the disease is on the farm and then once we've got um, a positive flock you need to obviously look at control and so here we can see that got different levels of control that we can um, have within an affected flocks. So culling out those uh, thin unproductive ewes will, will be of course one way of um, controlling those diseases but perhaps we might need to go a step further just to make sure that our flock um, stays on track and is productive. Um, so for example if we look at CLA we can see that vaccinating um, is an option with Glanvac. However, this is not a viable um, option if you want to eradicate the disease. So vaccinating um, with this va the Glanvac vaccine will, will reduce clinical signs so we won't get the obvious abscesses, but um, we cannot see whether a vaccinated animal is, uh, we can't differentiate between a vaccinated animal and an infected animal and so once we get get to that issue we we are unable to eliminate the disease so if you wanted to eradicate um, CLA we could only do that by testing and culling using the ELISA again uh, please look at the technical manual we've got a series of flow diagrams which should help you to um, differentiate between which of these diseases will work for different producers and in different situations and which will help with a control plan to suit, suit each farmer. If we look just very briefly at the available health schemes, a lot of you will know about the MV one which um, has about 3,200 members at the moment and there are very very few on the Yoni's um, scheme, uh, with less than 10, 10 sheep members at the moment. But just a word of warning, if we look at this MV1, we are saying that there is 98% confidence that the flock has a prevalence of 5% or less of MV. So we need to be fully aware that if you buy accredited sheep, it does not mean that there is zero risk. That's really, really important to stress. It's the best that we can offer, but actually um, there is still not zero risk in buying in accredited sheep. So to summarise, um, we have looked at through some of the prevalence we have of these diseases and subclinical and clinical signs. We've touched very briefly on diagnosis and control and we know that in all of these diseases these, these elements can be tricky. But actually what it comes down to is safeguarding your flock and a lot of it comes down to biosecurity and quarantine. We need to think very very carefully about these and we need to make sure that, that we get our farmers, our producers engaged in these to try and think carefully about what stock they're buying in and what they already have uh, on farm. And it really really is up to the individual um, and we need to tailor our control plans uh, to these individuals, individual flocks. So I'd just like to say thank you ever so much to um, Mark, uh, the, the uh, companies that we've collaborated with. So that's Innovis, um, Synergy Farm Vets, uh, Farm Post Mortem Limited, and also APHA, Biobest, and SRUC. Um, I'd like to thank AHDB Beef and Lamb for funding it and um, my supervisor, Dr. Piers Davies, 
And we also have special thanks to Izzy Wilkinson, Ben Stripnell, Emily Gascoigne, Katie Wayne, Liz Jennifer, Fiona Lovett, and Liz Kang. And I'd like to invite you all for any questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, that's some really lovely pictures within that um, presentation as well. Um, and it was really informative as well. <laughs> I hope no one was eating their dinner. <laughs> um, right, whilst we're waiting for some questions to come, um, I'd like to remind you there is some information on the conditions discussed in the sheep disease directory. Um, so, Nikki, the first question uh, that I've had here um, is, um, uh, when there's a known issue with um, Yoni's disease within a flock, if the decision yeah. is made to cull the whole flock and restock, what's the risk of the non-infected new sheep picking up the infection from the pasture contamination? Ooh. I'm going to field that one to Piers, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. uh, so the, the short answer is pretty high. Um, we've got a quite a nice example um, by looking at the experience of Iceland, where they imported Mydavisna, OPA and Yonis uh, in the 1920s, 30s, uh, and they were able to eradicate the viral diseases, um, but they were not able to eradicate Yonis because of its persistence within pasture. So the, whilst the absolute risk would depend on the extent of the infection and the extent of the pasture contamination in the previously infected flock, uh, it, it is highly likely that there's going to be some risk there of the new flock becoming infected because of the duration of survival of the of the pathogen in the pasture. So yeah, it is quite quite a substantial risk. The other element you've got to consider is how confident are you that the stock that you're buying are actually yonis free when you purchase them? Uh, because testing for yonis negative status is not straightforward by any means. Uh, and again, you're more than likely to be purchasing stock which are coming from a Yoni's uh, map infected farm uh, because of the prevalence that we have within the UK. So yes, it's a little bit of uh, judging what your expectations are, but yes, the risk is very high. Thank you, Piers. Um, I've got another question here, which is uh, Glanvac and Gwadar, are these vaccines available within the UK? Yes. Uh, so Oh, uh, yes, for, for both of them. They are they're available in the UK. Good Air is available very similar to any other vaccine. Uh, Glanvac is imported on a special import license from VMD. Uh, so not difficult to import. Um, it's a question for your for your local vet. Uh, and they can they can follow quite a straightforward procedure uh, showing that there is a need for the vaccine um, and then importing it for you. Lovely, thank you. Um, and can these um, can these diseases be controlled or prevented by nutrition in any way? No, um, no. Um, as you saw in the MV flock, um, it, they can prop up uh, an issue, but actually only for so long. So because um, these diseases are insidious, so it means that they gradually um, see the clinical signs and they, they have the infection pressure building within the flock. Nutrition can only do so much, but actually um, we do see flocks just running into a brick wall. It probably will mask the disease uh, for longer with, with good nutrition, I'd say, but it will not stop it, no. Okay. Um, another question here we've got. Um, we have a flock of NCM sheep. Uh, we've had four positive MV test results back last year. Uh, we're seeing a large amount of snotty ewes. One in seven ewes has a body condition score of two or less. Any advice other than, than more blood testing in order to retain the profitability of the flock? Sorry, say that again, uh, Liz. So they have Sorry, one. there's a, a flock here. They've got four positive um, MV test results back last year. And they're seeing a large amount of snotty uh, snotty use. Uh, one in seven has a body condition score of two or less. Um, have you got any advice other than more blood testing in order to retain the profitability of the flock? So how many, so my questions would be, I know you won't know the answer here Liz, would be how many were screened? So four positive, that's very low if it's out of of 100 use, but actually if it's out of 12 that is a substantial amount of, of uh, a, a proportion of the flock. So it depends on, on what proportion you sampled. Um, 
I guess, I guess what you could do is call a lot on clinical signs if you were suspecting. I mean, you know you've got MV within that block. Um, we also can do blood testing, uh, milk testing, sorry, uh, for MV, which we've done in a couple of dairy flocks. So perhaps at lambing time, um, we'd need to check this with your, your lab you were sending them to. But if you did um, milk sampling, that would be a way of reducing you know the cost of the vet coming out um but obviously there still would be the test and the cost of the test there too can i just add to that as well so i take it from the question if you're north country mules then it's a flying flock buying your replacements every year the other option you've got is to retain that flock as a closed flock cull hard as nikki said but have internal segregation between the new replacements, purchase the new replacements from a flock that's either accredited or pre-test them before you buy them, do a private purchase and run that as a clean flock. And if you've got really good internal biosecurity within the unit, then you can stop yeah. the dirty flock, the infected flock, from passing that infection onto the, the newly purchased replacements. And if you cull hard in the dirty flock, you can eradicate that problem by uh, over three, four years over the lifetime of, of those remaining ewes, but it involves a high degree of, of, uh, of culling on those clinical signs, those preclinical signs of respiratory disease or re recurrent persistent low body condition score. So there's no cheap answer to it, mm. but there are slightly more sort of conservative approaches compared to blood testing everything and culling everything on, on the base of the blood results. But you've got to bear in mind that actually for most farms, maintaining that internal biosecurity between a clean and a dirty flock is very hard to do robustly. But it is another option. Um, thank you. I've got another question here as well, which is, um, can sheep pick up ovine yonis from cattle and vice versa? Nikki, do you want me to deal with that one? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the short answer is probably yes. We don't know how efficiently they transmit it between the two species, um, but it is quite likely. Most of the evidence for uh, for yonis in cattle and sheep comes from Australia, and there we are now seeing more cases of cattle uh, infected with what was thought to be previously sheep strains and vice versa. The situation in the UK is by no means clear, but it would seem very plausible that the pathogen can move in both directions. But we don't really understand yet what the real risk factors are. So, so how risky the cattle strains are compared to the sheep strains and vice versa, and what you can do to prevent that or to reduce the risk. It's obviously an incredibly important question for the UK industry because mm. of so many mixed units. Um, but we need to we need to have more focused research in the UK to really understand how we can control that efficiently and what the real risk is, rather than just extrapolating from what's been shown in Australia with very different breeds, very different management systems. And the different breed susceptibility could be quite important there, along with different strain types of the pathogen. Fab. Um, so um, the next question I've got on here is, uh, it looks like it might have come from a vet. Uh, it says, I'm trying to advise a client with an apparent high prevalence of uh, Mida Visna. Uh, only a few have been tested, but all are positive. Uh, he can't afford to replace the whole flock and doesn't think that the testing, uh, testing the whole lot is financially viable. Uh, I feel all he can do is cull aggressively and, as you say, thin use and respiratory signs um, to keep a young flock, buy in replacements rather than rearing them. Uh, obviously, he might buy in MV, but the UK prevalence is lower than his flock. Do you think that's a good plan? Um, I, some, some elements. Um, he could, I think, as Piers sort of mentioned with the the other one, was to age, by age stratifying his flock. So by um, sort of keeping the younger use together and the older use uh, together and trying to, to you know manage them in that when you when you're doing any management decisions you're doing um, the youngest use first um, and actually you could potentially keep in some of the um, the replacements from those younger sheep but I, I think you know, the 
the question there has they've answered a lot of, they, they know a lot of the answers already I think and hopefully we've touched on some of them uh, just now Okay, um, lovely. I have another one. If you've got border disease um, in your flock, um, if a PI can be identified, could it be run with young stock to give them early exposure? So, not not reliably so is the actual short answer to it. Um, we have had a few cases where they try to do that, but the rate of transmission um, between a PI animal and the young stock or whoever uh, the other sheep is actually um, pretty unreliable. So um, even in sort of close confinement or running together for quite some time, we don't see that level of antibody development that you perhaps expect. Um, so it, it, I wouldn't I wouldn't rely on it is the answer. Um, I would rely, you know, border disease we can control um, with good nutrition uh, to a certain extent. We can, um, I'd probably remove that PI animal and um, we can try and uh, a few other other ways to try and control it really other than that. Is it, would you agree, Piers? Yes, I think that's the, the key element really. So how much are you relying on that animal, that PI animal, to cause sewer conversion and everything else? Uh, you could argue that it might do something, it might help, and if you've got quite a, a small flock, that might be enough, but if you've got a very large flock, then potentially you could make the situation worse. Uh, so it's, a it's also a relatively rare situation to actually have a PI animal that's alive at the right time and for long enough to be able to use in that way. So I think when I'd be talking to a farm in that situation, you've got to be very mindful of the numbers involved. And you can do th some things to actually check how effective it's been. So you can bleed a cohort of, of the uh, supposedly uh, naive animals first, leave them in for a month or six weeks or however, however long you've got, re-bleed a sample of those negative animals and see how many of them are converted. But the, th the biggest risk is when you've got very large groups, if the, the number of susceptible animals is large enough, you'll maintain a situation where you can get uh, spread of infection from transiently infected animals, and that can cause a sort of rolling pattern of infection. In small flocks, it's easier for the, for the infection to effectively burn itself out. But in large flocks with constant perturbation and a large enough number and contact with susceptible animals, then you can maintain it in the absence of a PI. So it is a difficult one to answer conclusively. Um, I think for a vet in that situation advising a farm, you've got to think about what the group sizes are like, what the time of year is, how long have you got before, uh, before tupping, because what you really don't want to have is ongoing transmission during tupping. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Um, I've got a, um, a question here about um, ovine yonis again. So if a sheep, uh, is infected as a lamb, what's its likely incubation incubation period before the disease sets in? That really, really depends. <laughs> so yeah, it, uh, how long is a piece of string is possibly the fairest way to answer that. So it may never develop clinical disease. We don't know what proportion of exposed animals as lambs uh, never develop clinical signs. We wouldn't normally expect lots of clinical disease in animals less than two or three years of age but from the data we have from fallen stock uh, surveys conducted by Ben Strugnell particularly um, we see an awful lot of animals who die with yonis uh, and are culled out with yonis but don't actually show overt clinical signs which are identified as yonis whereas if you can contrast that slightly potentially with OPA, where certainly he would describe this as animals dying of OPA rather than animals dying with yonis, which is a, a bit of a subtlety, but quite an important subtlety. So yeah, from our data, we'd, we'd expect actually you to get more and more clinical cases in three, four, five-year-olds. And we, we think we see that turning up as a reduced proportion of those older animals within the breeding flock. But identifying exactly when that's happening is, is quite difficult. It's a, a bit of a sliding scale that may be dependent on the individual susceptibility, may be dependent on the, uh, on the virulence, on the aggressiveness of the strain that they encounter, or it may be dependent just on the dose that they encounter. Uh, 
and how rapidly that then progresses. Again, we don't really understand what the determinants are of, of the fate of that lamb. What we do seem to see is that the younger the lamb is, is exposed to the pathogen, the more likely it is to become infected and eventually a proportion of those to show clinical signs, very much like you see in, in calves. So after six months of age, they're much, much less likely to actually become infected when they're exposed to the pathogen compared to when they're one, two, three, four months of age. It's not to say they can't become infected, but they're much less likely to as the gut develops uh, beyond that sort of six month period. Um, I think we're now on our last question, unless anyone else has got any uh, other other questions. Um, so um, I've got a question here with, could ploughing a field uh, bury the ovine yoni bacteria and reduced, uh, reduce the risk of spreading it? Uh, I think it certainly could. Uh, we don't know how effective that would be, um, but it certainly could and it certainly probably would help, you think, logically. If you compare that to other pathogens we have trapped in pasture, which survive in pasture, we know that that doesn't work particularly well for most things. So if you look at the situation with things like ORF or foot rot um, or uh, antimintic resistant uh, worms, ploughing doesn't eliminate it. It reduces it, but it doesn't eliminate it. And mainly that's because you've still got the headlands which are unploughed. You still have areas which are unploughed. Uh, and unless you replace the flock, you're going to have a reservoir being carried by the animals as well to reinfect the pasture. So it will help probably. Um, but it won't eradicate it and we don't know how effective it is. So wh whether I would advise someone to plough the fields just on that basis, I think I'd be a bit dubious about that. But if you're ploughing as part of your, as your, of your uh, pasture rotation anyway, then yes, it probably will help. Well, thank you very much that um that's the end of uh, end of the questions and the end of the webinar really i just want to say thank you very much uh, nikki for that brilliant presentation and discussion uh, and to to peers for uh, for contributing as well um, a really useful discussion there i'd just like to remind you that the presentation has been recorded and will be available on the ahdb youtube channels along with other previous webinars should you want to revisit it at any time uh, thanks again and have a good evening everyone thank you